Every coach, in my opinion, should have to go 0-12 or 1-11 your first year. When you win a game, you never, ever take it for granted. There is no such thing as a bad, a bad win. When did you know coaching was the perfect fit for you? Well, I always I wanted to teach. Uh, I have an elementary education degree. I taught sixth grade social studies right out of college. So I've always wanted to educate and teach. And as a player, we always think we're better than we really are. And uh, got a chance to play at Northern Illinois, finished that up, and uh, played in the NFL. And then it was Mike Nolan who actually cut me um, my third year and sat me down in his office, cut me. And then the second after he cut me, he offered me a coaching job. And he goes, I just want to let you know, I think you'd be a great coach. And I'm like, well, aren't I a player? You know, he's, well, not anymore. Uh, and so you can keep this NFL Europe thing. If you want to go start, go out there and go do that. Um, but your time's done with the Niners. I think you'd be a great coach. And he offered me a coaching job wow. and on the spot. And I said, what kind of job is it? And he said, I don't, I don't have it. I'm going to create it. And uh, so it took him a week to create it. And I went to take the job and I get a phone call from Columbus, Ohio. And uh, I don't know anybody in Columbus, Ohio. And it's Jim Tressel. And Jim Tressel was fraternity brothers with Mike Sabach, who coached me in college at Northern Illinois. And somehow Jim talked to Mike about, I have a job open. Do you know anybody who would be interested? He's like, you got to hire PJ. Huh. And next thing you know, Jim Tressel calls me, never met me. I never met Jim, offered me a GA job at The Ohio State University. And the next day I was there. Wow. So you had two job offers right after you. I was in high demand. <laughs> <laughs> I like uh, it. A recently cut five, 980 pound yeah, wide receiver that like didn't it. play much in the NFL is in high demand for coaching. I want to take you back to, and you mentioned it in your, in your answer. And my dad was a coach for 40 years. And I mean, at the end of the day, the best coaches are great teachers too, right? Don't you feel that's the... Well, yes. I mean, we're all teachers. I mean, we just, uh, the great thing about it, I have an elementary education degree. I teach, and then I love football, and coaching is a combination of both of them. And teachers, you know, they take that kid from the beginning of second grade, and they're better at the end of second grade, right? And that's what you hope. Coach comes from the word stagecoach. Take somebody from where they are to where they dream of being. And I've always had a passion for doing that. And my mom used to work at a special education school, and I got to see teaching at the simplest, simplest form. And I always worked there every summer and uh, got around a lot of the students and uh, with a lot of special needs. And uh, I got to see it and I, I just became attracted to it uh, of education and teaching and what it did for me. I mean, I, I, I can't tell you a lot of people in my life, but I can give you every teacher I had. And uh, those are the people who impact my life the most. Yeah. And then you actually taught a class, right, at Minnesota. Uh, tell me about that a little bit and just what was different about that than coaching football? What was harder about it or easier about it? Yeah, I was approached uh, by our uh, Carlson School of Management, our business, uh, business school, and uh, Teresa Glom's her name. And uh, I was approached if I would be interested in teaching a leadership course in our, in our business school. And I thought about it, I'm like, well, I'm not sure if I have that much time on my hands to be able to become a faculty member and a professor all of a sudden, because I know the demands that they have. However, she goes, no, 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 it's my class. I want you to co-teach it with me and we'll work around your schedule and I think it would be fabulous because we run a leadership council uh, meeting once a month and then I have a board of directors meeting with our, our leaders every week and um, she's like I want you to incorporate those types of things that you, and the lessons that you have in leadership into the business school and I said I'm in and so we collaborated and, and did a co-teaching and it was one of the most enjoyable experiences I've ever had because the first day of class it was so funny because everybody's like uh, Teresa introduced me, and uh, how many of you know Coach Fleck? And everybody's like, and I was like, wait, what? You don't know, I'm a, you don't, I, you don't know me? And, and uh, it was one of those real humbling moments, like, hold on, you're not in the football world anymore. I'm in a high academia where I got an 18 on the ACT. These people got 33s, 34s, and 35s. So nor do they even probably care who I am, but it was so fun to watch them uh, watch how business and sports, especially in leadership, go hand in hand. And it was a very authentic, real class, shared a lot of life experiences with them, and uh, we had a lot of fun. If you had to pick one thing, uh, or maybe more than one, but what makes you feel most proud as a coach? And it probably goes along with that, seeing how guys develop, but what? what... You know, I, th I think there's a lot of, there, people always say what they want, right? Uh, but are they willing to pay the price to always get it? And what I love about our program, and what I love about watching young men go through our program is, 
They say they want it, and then there's a price to pay to get it, academically, athletically, socially, and serving and giving. And if you can do those things, you're going to live a pretty elite life. There's going to be ups, there's going to be downs, but if you can keep rowing the boat through that, you're going to be okay. And watching a player like we have, Chris Altman Bell here, he's in his seventh year. He's got three degrees and he chose to keep coming back to our culture. Brevin Span Ford is on his sixth year. Tyler Newman's on his fifth year. That's 18 years combined amongst these three guys. Watching them walk in as pretty immature freshmen and watching them leave knowing they're going to be elite husbands, elite fathers, uh, elite members of their community, that's, the, that's why we're in it. All this other stuff, I mean, it, it, it's, it's great and all, but most coaches would prefer none of this yeah. and just be with our team 24-7. Yeah. In your history, player, coach, what's the most, the best game or the most memorable game you, you recall being a part of? I'm sorry for this one. Uh, it, it, was, it was back in, in 2019. And, I was there uh, too. I know you were. I know. Uh, I, I would say there, there's a bunch of them, right? But I could sit here and talk about the first time we beat Wisconsin in 14 straight years back in 2018. But 19 was like we can do something really special at Minnesota because trust comes down to time, consistency, and proof. And you need proof. And when we were 8-0, Penn State was 8-0. Um, you know, we're playing a top four team in the country. You know, we're top 15 in the country. This can change the dynamic of the entire institution of the way people look at it, right? And beating Penn State that day and watching our fans who have deserved that type of win on that field um, for so long and to see their team now ranked seventh in the country after that, knowing that, hey, when I say we can win a national title and we can get to the college football playoff and we can do this and we can do that, it's that far away. We're able to reach and go grab that. And uh, to feel the energy of Huntington Bank Stadium that day and see the response to the victory of that and what that did, um, especially with the group of men that was on there who had to deal with a lot in 17 and 18 with the changing of coach, a divided locker room, a boycott, a sexual assault case, all these things to see them stick and have that 2019 experience uh, at home against Penn State was uh, is something I'll never forget. Yeah, I remember watching you do the uh, the body surf in the in the locker room too after the game. <laughs> we do that, that after every win. I've done that 11 years okay. after every win, and I'll tell you why I do it. Because people say, "Oh, it's all about it." Every coach, in my opinion, should have to go 0 and 12 or 1 and 11 your first year. My dad says the exact same. Because thing. when you are 0 and 10, and I'm 32 years, this is my first year being a head coach too, and I'm the youngest in the country. When you win a game. You never, ever take it for granted. There is no such thing as a bad, a bad win, ever. Now, maybe from the media standpoint, but when you're a coach and you're one in 11 your first year, there's no such thing as a bad win. So we, I, have, I have body surfed 11 straight years and uh, I am unapologetic for it. What would you prefer, what do you prefer? Football in 90 degree weather, football in 20 degree weather? Uh, can I have San Diego weather? Right in the middle? <laughs> uh, I would say for me, uh, the 20 degree weather. Uh, I, I grew up in Chicago. I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up with the Chicago Bears and Dick Buckus and, uh, and Walter Payton and Mike Singletary. And uh, that was my generation. I was Jim McMahon for four straight Halloweens. Uh, I didn't want to be anything else but the punky QB. So I would say 20 degree weather. It just, that's where I'm from. That's how I was raised. That's my first uh, introduction of Soldier Field. and. Um, and it was never warm when I went to Soldier Field, and I never had a good view. Yeah. <laughs> One of the other things that I've heard you talk about, and, and you've been very outspoken about, uh, mental health and, and how you're an advocate for that. Talk about a couple of the programs or a couple of the things that you guys have set up at Minnesota for your players and, and for the athletes on, on, on campus there. Yeah, well, first of all, I think we all set up things the best we can and reflect back on our past, what we'd want as a student athlete. And, you know, I went through my own mental health struggles when I was a San Francisco 49er. And back then, 04 through 06, there weren't, as, there were, there weren't any resources. You know, you had to go to almost a hospital to do that. Um, these days, our players have six full-time, 24-7 specialists uh, to help our student athletes overcome the obstacles that they have. And, you know, we call it more sports performance. Uh, mental performance. You know, we have we have a strength coach to get us bigger, stronger, faster. We have a quarterback coach to make us throw the ball better and more accurate. We have all these coaches, right? Well, where's the brain coach? So we have a 10 staff football staff, but where's the brain coach on that staff? And a lot of times as a head coach in college, you are that as well, not just in the legal part, but you're setting the mindset 
for your players constantly. You're setting the energy level, you're setting the mindset, you're setting the outlook. But if players ever need that type of help, we have so many resources at the University of Minnesota that our players can go to anonymously. Every Monday I meet with non-coaching members. Think about that, non-coaching members. The, the mental health specialists, our doctors, our physicians, our trainers, our nutritionists, our strength staff, our academic advisors, our player development people, our support staff. We talk about every single player. And we talk about every single player, not about football, body language. Is there a change in their body language? Did somebody say they broke up with their girlfriend or their significant other and they didn't tell anybody but Jackie Lenish, our academic advisor? We're looking for signs constantly in our program. And that's part of the elite mindset. Uh, even us as coaches, being elite, looking for signs that could be leading to something that's under the surface. And body language is a critical piece of that. 70% of our human communications done nonverbal. So we should be looking for that as coaches as well. And, um, you know, we're trained in that, you know, we, we, as coaches. Yeah, I know you've got a lot of these or a lot of things maybe you could choose. Maybe you have a whole wardrobe of this. But if you were to put your credo, PJ Fleck credo on a T-shirt, what would it be? Like a logo or a yeah. saying? Yeah. I mean, bro the boat. Yeah. Necktown mentality. Talk about that that mentality, what's that? Social studies teacher, so a necton is an organism that can flow freely through a water current without the water current dictating its behavior. So the ultimate necton is a great white shark. It can go anywhere in the sea, anytime, anywhere. It's never full, it's always attacking, it wants more, and it can't go backwards. If it goes backwards, it dies. It's gotta go forward. You gotta keep going through life forward. So having that necton mentality, uh, that energy level for life, we're, we're a blip in the radar. We all have this much. What are you going to do with the impact and the platform you've been given? And that's why I have so much energy. And then row the boat, you know, with uh, my son passing away in 2011. That's when that was created and that's what it's for is to humanize you. Uh, sometimes as coaches, people look at us as uh, celebrities and, and uh, these, these figures, but you know, I've been through a divorce. I've lost a child. I've done a lot of things you other people have that go through. And you want your state public figures to say, hey, you know what, I've been through that too. And they use this and that can help me get through that as well. So those would be the two things, row the boat on the front, neck time mentality on the back. You've had success, you've won games, you've won big games. Uh, okay, now what's it take or what does the next step look like? You know, where, where do you go and what do you have to do uh, to get there? How do you define that? that well, next we, we, first of all, we decide, find success as the peace of mind you get from knowing you did everything you can to be the best you could be, right? So if I get the most out of my team, academically, athletically, socially, and spiritually, if I can get the most out of them, that's successful. Everybody's competing for one championship, one team, right? And in the Big Ten, there's one out of the 14 that are actually going to win it. Does that mean everybody's not successful? You need to be in the race. You need to be in the hunt. For the last three full football seasons, we've been right they're in the hunt. And it isn't one thing that'll carry us over. It's better in every area that we've, we've fallen up a little short in. So just constantly focusing on the process and the execution of our process and focusing on the things that matter to us. If we can keep doing that more consistently and keep adding better talent on the field and off the field to our organization, we'll break through at some point. One of the things you talked about, you know, just growing your process and, and being there at the end, and you have been, you know, obviously your players are aware of that too. You know, how can you finish stronger maybe? Uh, you know, how do you convey that message or, or what, how do you approach that? Well, some of it's in your control, some of it's out of your control. We talk about starting fast, accelerate in the middle and finish strong. And out of the last three years, uh, the full seasons, we've, we've done two of the three. But what I love about it is when you get a seventh year player like Chris Altman Bell coming back, he's seen all six of those and he knows what we need to do to get that better. Brevin Span four has been there six years. He's going to be a major part of our offense. He's seen five years of coming up that short. Tyler Newman has been there five years. He's seen four years of that. And they've all decided to pass up on the NFL on a lot of money to come back to do exactly what you're saying. Not to say it's guaranteed improvement because nothing is, but that's the reasons they came back, uh, to be part of our culture, to bring something that we haven't had in such a long time, and, and I, uh, I commend them for that.